Three nil, Tyler Rockwell. It was mm-hmm. the result we needed, but not the performance we wanted. That sound fair? I mean, I think it was probably one of the better performances that we've seen from this U.S. team. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there were still some concerns for sure. <laughs> okay, so this is the Total Sox Show. Quick take, hot take, USA mm-hmm. Thrill. Three, not thrill. Mm. <laughs> Definitely not thrill. Nicaragua, yeah. nil. It puts the US top of Group B, but with, yeah, um, I want to say a rough and tumble performance. Yeah, I think we both, uh, we talked about this a little bit via text, that we were both kind of having trouble really focusing and like kind of figuring out the rhythms. And I yeah. think that's because uh, Nicaragua really didn't want there to be rhythms. So it felt like there's a lot of fouling and a lot of physical play. And it was sort of a disjointed game overall, which I think probably impacted my enjoyment of it as well. Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't much of a spectacle, right? It's definitely the least entertaining thing I've seen on FXX for a while. It's <laughs> <laughs> a bold claim, especially given that Rob Stone announced that I think following this game, the East Coast got Amazing Spider-Man 2, and Ooh. then the West Coast got Amazing Spider-Man. So Wait, which one's Amazing Spider-Man? Gone. Is that Andrew Garfield, or is that it Toby McGuire? It is, Mc- Andrew oh. Garfield. Okay, yeah, exactly. I can't even say I've seen that one. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay, so um, let's think of it this way. Um, I agree that it, I mean, I said it just wasn't an entertaining game or performance. But when I went back, I rewatched little chunks. I cheated a little bit for a quick take hot day and quickly rewound and watch little chunks. And I get the feeling that that's mostly Nicaragua's fault. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, I think it was it was their game plan was be aggressive, be physical, try to knock the U.S. around, maybe knock them out of their game a little bit and go at them whenever the situation allowed for it. And so I think that meant a lot of U.S. players going down. And then I think near the end, we saw a lot of CONCACAF uh, rearing its head as well. <laughs> what do you mean by that? There's just a lot like I think I tweeted about it that like there was one moment where the guy the guy who got sandwiched like legitimately that's a foul like or at least you can understand why they would stop and make sure he got treatment. Yeah. But he did the like two or three rollovers the way yes. you would never do if you're hurt. Like uh-huh. I have never had that inclination to be like, oh, my stomach really hurts. I better roll around on the ground a whole bunch. That right. should do it. Because like, if you're hurt, more. you're down. Yeah, right. you're hurt. You're not you're not moving. You're moving as little as possible. So when you see that, it's sort of is like, oh, I see what we're doing here. That's why that's why paramedics say don't move him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they don't, yeah. don't turn up in the ambulance to say, let's roll him around a few times. Yeah, exactly. It's the worst, <laughs> worst paramedic ever. Like, ma'am, like, what happened? This man is down. I don't know what's wrong. Roll him around. <laughs> like, that's the obvious solution. <laughs> so, yeah, I agree. It was it was rough and tumble. Um, yeah. I also think maybe that was kind of a plan on Nicaragua's part to be, I think I wrote in my notes, a poor man's Diego Simeone Atletico Madrid which was they sort of crowded a lot of numbers around the ball and really tried to just put loads of pressure on the United States. Like even, even Joe Corona's goal, you notice he ended up with about five men around him. So it definitely was kind of like... He tried to dribble the ball onto the goal. That's true. (laughs) But there was a lot of kind of um, swarm ball, but not in the like, not in the U5 kind of way, more of in just whoever's got the ball, make sure there are lots of people around them. And therefore no one was really able to make much progress. And it ended with Nicaragua fouling us. I mean, we literally had two penalty kicks. I know that we didn't make, we didn't make either of them but the, there's a reason we had two penalty kicks and that was part of Nicaragua's game plan you know who was mad about those penalty kicks uh Bruce Arena Nicaragua's manager <laughs> who said who, who said that neither one of them was a penalty it's like maybe watch that footage again before yeah. you make those statements yeah maybe watch that sliding handball one more time yeah yeah that was a penalty <laughs> um yeah so I mean I think I think Nicaragua definitely made it difficult and I do think the United States made it difficult for themselves at times and yes. I still think there was an element of these guys were once again told, like, be aggressive, go at them. Like, I want to see you dominate this game. And so, like, like for example, and we can talk about him a little more later or now, whatever you want to do. But, like, Graham Zussi had three or four very bad touches. But yeah. they all they all felt like they were sort of him having been briefed of, like, get the ball back into Nicaragua's, like, uh, defensive third as quickly as you can. And so oh, it would be— and so it felt like it was a little bit of that, like he heard footsteps almost. If I gotta get it back in, oh, I dribbled out of bounds. Whoops, so you think, oh, I touched out of bounds. You think basically he was hurried? Yeah, I think so. And I think, and I think, I think that mostly because so that Corona goal that you mentioned, like it, I think the story about it will be that maybe it should have been a handball and thus another penalty, and like maybe yeah. he should have taken it quicker. But if you go back and watch. It was one of the best sequences of play I saw from the United yeah. States in this game. But do you know what? It starts with Graham Zuzzi accidentally putting the ball out of bounds for it a does. Nicaragua and throw in, and then the exactly. US wins the ball back. But but see, that's <laughs> that's kind of what informs the second part of it, is that that's where I say it felt like the United States was trying to play like very quick, high-tempo soccer. And so I think Graham yeah. Zuzzi kind of bump, like bundles it out of bounds because he's trying to play quickly. But from there, I think it's a throw-in that Matt Miazga collects. 
He plays to Bill Hamid. Hamid plays it back to Miazga. Miazga plays it to McCarty. McCarty plays it to Dwyer. Dwyer like flicks it on for Bedoya. Bedoya plays it in. And most of that sequence was one and two touch passing. Yes. And it, and it was just like get the ball, turn, play the ball, get the ball, turn, play the ball. Like it was very fast and like high tempo. And you, they went from literally their goalkeeper to back of the net in like eight seconds so and it was it, a very good transition yeah i mean i agree i really enjoyed that passage of play and obviously i enjoyed it because it was a goal but i enjoyed how quickly the u.s moved the ball but i couldn't yeah. help thinking that with what we've said about nicaragua with the way they're sort of like you know crowding the ball making it hard yeah. making it physical a better team had that kind of move that the u.s had for the first goal met they had that throughout they would have that many many times throughout the game yeah. as opposed yeah. to kind of just that one time yeah yeah i mean you know absolutely yeah and i think that that was the united states maybe still struggling a little bit to combine through the middle. I thought Joe Corona played well. I did think he played better than a lot of other people who played in that role. And I think it was probably telling that the minute Kellen Acosta, not Kellen Acosta, excuse me, Kellen Rowe came off the field, the United States really struggled for like a good 10 or 15 minutes. And then they kind of got their groove back yeah. and eventually got that third goal. But can't you imagine if it was like, um, say it was Benny Failharbor in that sort of more number 10 role. And he was the, the guy that we could be playing the ball into. Yeah. I, I just imagine that this would have been a more composed performance from the United States. Just having a guy who can easily shrug off challenges and hold onto the ball and then pull something out. Yeah, agreed. And I think not to let them off the hook, but I, I think it was Leander Sherlockins tweeted and the numbers won't be right here. I apologize. But it was something like this United States team combined has like 115 caps. But if you remove like Bedoya and Zussi, it drops to 50. <laughs> there are some, so it's like it shows you that maybe they didn't have that experienced player yeah. and that kind of veteran who knows how to like slow it down. Let's just keep possession. Everybody chill out for a second. I'm sure we'll find a goal. Like it just kind of <laughs> felt like we got to get something. We got to get something. We're aware we got to get something. Let's all go get something. Oh, shoot. We still can't get anything. Are you with me thinking that that goal is mostly Dax McCarty? Because he's yeah. I read them. Um, I think I retweeted it earlier. I read the um, Bobby Warshaw's uh, piece yeah, for Howler on line yep. yeah and he talked about mid, you want midfielders who want the ball and that sort of lifts the teammates around you um, and McCarthy you could see him kind of demanding that ball off Miazga and then being yep. brave enough to turn and then being brave enough to sort of play that ball which I don't know what the packing stats on it would be but I'm sure he beats like four or five players as he plays between the lines into the feet of Dwyer who then lays it off so it really is it, it all, for me it all starts with McCarthy yeah. wanting the ball and then being brave enough to play a kind of risky pass I think it's I think it, it, a huge percentage of the credit goes to Dax McCarty, I think. Uh, but I will say, I think Miazga definitely gets credit for he gets that ball back from Hamid. He takes a touch and then he plays it right to McCarty. And it's like a very it's not a very difficult pass, but it's a very confident pass. Yeah. It's sort of like I know where I'm supposed to play this ball. There it goes. It's a great check back from Dom Dwyer. And it's a great little flick on into the path of Bedoya. And then Bedoya does really well to kind of out muscle the guy, mm -hmm. then create separation, then do that reverse b ball back. Like I do think it was very good. But yes, I'm with you that it's Dax McCarty. McCarty, I think, kind of linking up things. That was really key. And is it, it was the classic Alejandro Bedoya in terms of he recognized when that ball went yep. into Dwyer, he recognized that if he, if he accelerated down the right at that exact moment, yep. he would be available for the one touch pass from Dom Dwyer. Yep. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. So that, was good a good, stuff. so that was a good example of a player really wanting the ball. Uh, yeah. Maybe a not great example was the two times the United States had penalties. <laughs> well, they both wanted to take them. This is true. <laughs> It just, I don't know, did you get a read on if the, I'm sorry, I can't remember the Nick Ragnarok keeper's name. Did you get yeah. a read on if he did anything special? Or was it pretty much what I saw, which is two penalties that were hit sort of not far enough to the left? I mean, I thought Dwyer's penalty, weirdly, uh, Corona's penalty was probably the worst hit of the two. Yeah. But I think Dwyer's penalty was the worst of the two because he hit it in like the worst spot you can hit a penalty for a goalkeeper to save. Like it was, it was too far inside and it was like at the exact height where you'd be diving. Like Corona's was on the floor and it wasn't well taken, but at least it was on the floor. And that's a little bit more difficult to save if you're a goalkeeper. Yeah. I'm yeah. I'm very, very disappointed with both those penalties. Yeah. You could see Dom Dwyer's face as well. He was kind of like, yeah. Oh no, they just had that close mm -hmm. of me chewing close above me chewing gum and everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I missed. <laughs> yes, I mean, and and so that was that was pretty frustrating, especially given at that point the United States only had the two goals and then was looking likely to play Costa Rica, which nobody really wanted to see happen, <laughs> except maybe Costa Rica, except maybe Costa Rica, yeah, and, um, and definitely Panama. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can we talk about the second goal? The man, the man himself, Kellen Rowe, the guy who I think, even with that weird um, defensive effort against Panama, um, has come out of this group stage with maybe the most credit of any of the sort of bubbly, fringy players on this US squad. 
Yeah, I think so. I, mean, I think he has improved his stock the most. Uh, well, maybe not the most, but he is definitely in the top like three or four players who have uh, done the best in terms of kind of maybe getting a little more attention from Bruce Arena going forward. Can I tell you the, the thing that I noticed most about this goal is it was the one time that U.S. pressing really, really worked. Yep. So it begins with, a, what, is it Zuzi and Pontius it, on the it right? It is yep. Yeah, so yeah, some credit where it's due then to, to Graham Zuzi. Because also I noticed throughout this, this whole game, I, I went back and looked at chunks. I also noted it when I saw it the first time. The U.S. kind of pressed but ineffectively like a team who had only just been taught how to press the ball. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they like, did. They yes. would, one person would press to the ball, but then there would be another guy open so they wouldn't cut off the other pass. And that's why you had so many times that ball sort of like pop loose, bubble around, two guys challenge for it, one of them stronger, then it pops loose, then it bubbles around, mm-hmm. then two guys challenge for it. And that's what made it such such bad, bad soccer. But this is the one time that I think Zuzi and Pontius did it really well. The ball popped to what, Alejandro Bedoya, I believe. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. he, and he played it into Dwyer. Wasn't Dwyer's shot kind of blocked, which is why Bedoya got a second yeah. chance to then play it to Kellen Rowe. I believe you are correct, sir. But great composure from Alejandro Bedoya, right? So yeah. two, two assists, two assists, the first two goals from Bedoya, but a great, great finish from Kellen Rowe as well. And now we have to be sad for a moment because Alejandro Bedoya has departed. He has left the team. Has he? Yeah, he's been, I think, released from uh, playing responsibility because he's going home for the birth of his, I believe, second child. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, we're, we're maybe skipping ahead a bit here because I was going to talk about this at the end, but yeah. they've more or less announced the uh, the five players at least who are going to be coming in, five of the six that are co- going to be coming in to be added to the squad, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's uh, it's Darlington Nagby, Michael Bradley, Tim Howard, Josie Altador, Clint Dempsey is the yep. five that I recall. So I was going to have a, co- a whole conversation with you about who's leaving, and it turns out the, the answer is Alejandro Bedoya is leaving. Yeah, and then there may be more. I, I, that was the only one I had seen because I think the arena press conference had just started yeah. when we started recording. Uh, so maybe he's announced more since then. But well, I'll tell uh, you what, when we, when we do our preview of the quarterfinal, which will be against either Honduras or Jamaica or El Salvador, we'll find out, mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll find out in a day or so, um, maybe then we'll go deep on the roster changes. That sounds good. And I will say... You, you also it, permit me to rant and rave about how this is a, an insane thing that we're doing, by the way. That's fine with me. I will also add uh, in a quick frantic scroll through Jeff Carlisle's Twitter timeline, it sounds like maybe Sean Johnson is also going home, which maybe opens the door for uh, Jesse Gonzalez to come in. No, that's, I think that's replacing Tim Howard. Oh, Tim Howard, of course, of course. obviously. Never yeah, mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to talk about the third and final goal? Um, sure. It's the Graham Zuzi delivery. It's the Matt Miazga. Is it a diving header or just a falling header? Uh, I'm going to say falling header. Falling header, but a yeah, good, yeah. good finish. Good finish. Mm-hmm. And kind of his... Um, I think it's like your Gold Cup centre-back hero moment, right? You score the goal yep. that puts the US top of the group. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and it, it's, a, it's a great header. It's down. It's powerful. It's what you want. He's also, like, very smart in that he's hanging out near, like, the bottom corner and just recognizes, like, he's not marked. So he times that run really, really well and then books it into the box to be on the, he- on the end of it. But with that said, I mean, you got to give a bunch of credit to Graham Zussi because it is a really, really well-hit ball. It's exactly where it needs to be. It's far enough away that the goalkeeper's not going to come, but it's high enough in the air that the defense is going to have trouble tracking it. It's a perfect ball from Graham Zussi. It's kind of a classic Graham Zussi U.S. men's national team performance, right? Loads yep. of frustrating moments. One really dangerous play where we basically squared it across his own six-yard yep. box that we somehow got, somehow got away with. But in the mm. end, he's involved in two of the U.S his goals mm-hmm. and and as i said on twitter two things here the first being as i said on twitter uh, at least this time he only had the assist in ruining <laughs> animals evening so there's that um but the second thing is yeah i think this kind of like this game was not very like reassuring for me as graham zussi is a right back because i don't think he was doing much as a right back in the sense that like i think <laughs> and like like i know that sounds harsh and i'm not no, really trying to, it's funny because it's true that's why I'm, laughing. Things, like, I'm, I'm not trying to be critical because i don't think he had a bad game per se i don't think he had a great game maybe not even a yeah he had the assist i guess he had a good game but it was a lot of like that very aggressive pressure that you talked about. I saw that a lot. I saw that in the first couple minutes. I, I noted it as like, oh, I see what we're doing here. Like yeah. we're getting those fullbacks forward because we didn't do that last game. Mm-hmm. And I do think a lot of the opening ten minutes was an attempt to immediately address some of the things that went wrong in the first game. We can talk about that in a sec. But to finish the Graham Zusi point, he was like really aggressive. He you know played good balls in at times. 
But I also don't trust him to like sit back and do the solid defending and get the clearances that need to be handled and just be kind of calm in defense. He still looks a little uncertain back there. And that is worrying when we play an opponent that isn't Nicaragua or Martinique or Panama. Yeah, it worries me the, the number of times that he's caught with balls go, that go in behind him and either he's just not yeah. there at all or he tries to meet it with a header and it just catches like the back of his man bun and flicks mm. on. Like, I almost and, think maybe yeah. he should cut that man bun down because there's too many flick-ons going backwards um, <laughs> down the left wing. Yeah, I don't disagree. I also, <laughs> I'm aware of people that he didn't play against Martinique. My point is still that that he he just needs to look a little bit more confident on the ball when in a defensive position as opposed to, like, being that aggressive outside back. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, but okay, the, but before, the, before we move on, I want to talk about Juan Agadello's role in that goal. Sure. Do you know what I'm talking about? Because he's the one that gets fouled on his way through. Yep. But then there's a, there's maybe four or five minutes of stoppage because I think there's an injury to a Nicaraguan player. There's also a, no, there's a red card, right? The guy that mm-hmm. fouls Agadello is sent off. So it's, yep. a, it's a long, long time before the free kick. And I think it's easy to forget that it's Agadello's sort of run and dribble and move. He does a great sort of cut move um, mm-hmm. that earns, that holds, first of all, holds onto the ball. Then like makes forward progress, doesn't panic, doesn't try and force a ball through when it's not on. Then he pulls out a move, which is a thing that maybe we were lacking for most of this game when we were being crowded. We, like, we didn't have the Benny Fireharbor to pull out a trick. Um, and then he gets taken down. So I think even in the short spell he had, I think Agadello really made an impact. Um, and yep. couple this with his performance against Martinique. And I'm much more up on Agadello than I was before this tournament. Yeah, and I promise I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer here, but I am going to go negative in just one second. But first, I want to say to your point, yes, absolutely. I think it's a really impressive run from Agudelo, and I think, again, the United States really benefited from his mobility and his willingness to run off the ball. One player who I don't think did a very good job in that regard is Jordan Morris. And if you go back and watch this sequence, Morris doesn't really help Agudelo out at all. Like, yes, he's marked, but that's the time when if you're the forward and you're marked, you run away. Like, you try to open up space, and Morris just kind of casually jogs along and looks at Agudelo the whole time. And this has been a criticism we've had of of him in the past, as have other pundits, that Morris doesn't do the smartest off the ball running at times. And so I think that's kind of frustrating. But I think it makes Agudelo's decision making and the overall play look that much better because he doesn't really have much help. And he's able to beat somebody, then draw that foul. And even if he hadn't been fouled, I think he gets a shot or is in on goal. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. Okay. any more (laughs) any more any more positives? Yeah, I I wanted to to go back to what I was saying about how I felt like the United States was trying to kind of right the wrongs from the from the Martinique game. Oh yeah, yeah, I was interested in that. Yeah, in the first minute. Like uh, the ball went back to the center backs and I saw Dax McCarty make a like 20 or 30 yard sprint to be the immediate outlet for one of the center backs. Yes. And and he got the ball right away and he turned and played that same ball forward. And it felt like the two center backs had been told, like, you have two touches and you're playing it on the ground. <laughs> and they were looking for McCarty every single time. And it felt like they had been told, this is the guy you're going to. But is not going to drop that deep. You're just focused on playing it to Dax. <laughs> you think they've been like practicing for a few days of only passing to sort of red hair? I mean, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> the, the pale one with the red. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it also, I think it makes more sense that if you're going to try to play your way out of pressure like that, you have a person who's going to be responsible. Yeah. And, and I do think maybe in retrospect, a problem was that like in the last game, it rolled on and Acosta, maybe they didn't know who was supposed to be doing it at any given moment. Yeah. And so sometimes Roldan would do it. Sometimes that Acosta would do it. But sometimes it would take them an extra couple of seconds to be like, oh, it's me this time. OK. I think, every- kind of, I think just neither of them is quite as brave as Dax McCarty, mm-hmm. right? McCarty will, and again, I'm kind of leaning on that Bobby Walshaw article because I was really impressed by it and it really like yeah. had me thinking about how central midfield partnerships work. Um, mm-hmm. When you're sort of brave enough to demand the ball even when you're under pressure because you just have the confidence that you know how to shield a guy, know how to turn out of pressure, um, and you just go and make yourself available even when it's hard. I think yeah. that's what McCarty has over Acosta and Roldan. Yeah, I think so. And I, and so I think you could see him look that much more confident and that much more capable in this game. And I think, again, Dax McCarty is a player who raised his stock a little bit, and I think he needed to. So I'm glad to see him coming out of this one with a positive check mark next to his name. Can we look back a little bit then on the group stage experience as a whole? Because sure. it, it has been a bumpy, bumpy ride, right? It has, with the caveat <laughs> that I saw a thing right before we started recording that I think ESPN put out that, like, it wasn't as bad as the 2015 Gold Cup, at least. Mm-hmm. Now, I know I think in the 2015 Gold Cup, the United States played slightly better opposition. I'm not entirely confident because I can't honestly say who we played in the group, group stage in 2015. But, but we I think took we our had, A like, team, right? Didn't we take like Josie Altador with an injury? Mm-hmm. That's how much we were taking our A team. We risked, yeah. we risked the big name players first rather than like keeping yeah. them in reserve. 
And I think the United States have like allowed fewer shots in this group stage than they did in 2015. They've had more expected goals. They've had more shots. They've had more possession. I think they've actually scored more goals as well. So again, not the strongest of opponents, but it is like in that regard, if you look at it from a sheer statistics standpoint, it's not as bleak as it might have seemed watching these first three games. And then it's what? It's a tie with Panama, who are maybe the fourth best team in CONCACAF. It's a narrow win over Martinique, but still a yeah. win. Right? That's the rough one, I think. Yep. And then this game is kind of the result you would maybe more or less expect. Yeah. So I in hindsight, so. it's not all that bad. Mm-hmm. And you've got to remember, it really was. Um, I think the, the mood going into it or the, the method going into it is, OK, we're going to experiment with some players. It's going to be a much, much weakened US lineup. But we are confident that we're going to get through it anyway. And me, being Bruce Arena, gets to look at a bunch of new guys. Yeah. And I and think we essentially got away with it, right? This would be a disaster if we got to look at a bunch of new guys, but like Christian Roldan had scored three own goals against Martinique, then we're suddenly in trouble. Mm-hmm. You know so what I mean? the, Yeah. No, 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 absolutely. But I think there's, I want to say this because I like, I kind of said it to you a little bit. I think I said it to uh, Albert as well when I was talking with him. I feel like there's a chance the United States is going to win this gold cup. Um, and I, and I felt this, there's always after a chance. The, well, and I felt this like after the Martinique game, only that like, it, it reminds me a tiny, 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 tiny bit of the Women's World Cup in 2015 when everybody was sort of like, oh, this U.S. team is underperforming. They look really bad. They should be destroying these teams. They don't look like a unit. Jill Ellis maybe doesn't know what she's doing. We all thought she was doing great. Now, all of a sudden, we're a little bit worried. And, and I think you and I at the time were much more positive than a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, more positive than we've been in this tournament for sure. Yeah. But I do have this feeling that like the United States puts it together. They bring in their some more of their A players. And maybe they win this tournament, especially with a week in Mexico. And then and then all of a sudden the narrative becomes like, well, you go back like they fought their way to a win against Martinique. And, you know, <laughs> they fought their way to that third goal they needed to get. And suddenly this is the team that like doesn't know how to die and does what it needs to do. Um, so that is definitely one possible narrative. It's not one that I would necessarily buy into. But I do feel like there's a chance this team starts to put it together and maybe makes a deeper run of this tournament than I would have maybe thought they would. And the weird thing is you kind of hit the reset button after the group stage, right? Because yep. you can bring in those six new guys. And again, we'll remind you, those guys are going to be, we, we're pretty, pretty confident it's going to be Michael Bradley, Josie yeah. Altador. Wait, how did Clint- you know it was Michael Bradley and Tim Howard? <laughs> Clint Dempsey, Tim Howard, Darlington yeah. Nagby, I think we'll add a lot. Darlington yeah. Nagby is the exact player that I, th- that I think has mm-hmm. been missing for a few games. He's a guy that wants the ball all the time and is confident receiving the ball and moving the ball, right? It's that, he's that guy. But you're bringing mm-hmm. in like the next level quality of US national team players. So it's almost like this group stage is forgotten because suddenly the core of the team returns. It was it was pretty mean of Bruce Arena, though, to call Benny Failhopper and then just ask how his day was and then hang up the phone. That seemed, that seemed harsh. That seemed unnecessarily harsh. It's like, it's like, hey, what are you doing Wednesday, July 19th around 9 p.m. Uh, in Philadelphia? Uh, Benny says, oh, nothing. And Bruce says, exactly. <laughs> oh bruce <laughs> brutal it's brutal cold. it's cold <laughs> <laughs> i mean this is it's saturday evening we're recording this it's sunday tomorrow winter is coming so maybe he just <laughs> just trying to prepare benny for the coldness oh yeah final call i guess for our game of thrones 11 um as you prepare yep. for the new season coming back also one more shout for the top draw soccer show find it on itunes and whatever other podcast provider you use first episode will be this wednesday yep all right, Taylor, anything else on this game or the Gold Cup group stage before we move on? Yeah, uh, two quick things. Yeah. Uh, I, I enjoyed uh, what I saw from uh, Joe Corona mostly. Obviously, the penalty was not great, mm-hmm. but I did see a lot of him like kind of comfortable on the ball, getting the ball, and again, turning under pressure, not being really afraid to try stuff when he had a man on him. I thought that was pretty positive. And then I'll just say that, I mean, you can when you're a goalkeeper, you can only like save what's put in front of you and do what you do against the opponent you have. And I think Bill Hamid did a good job. I think yeah. he, he didn't face that much, but he had that one save that he parried and then was up quickly and collected. Yes. I thought that was good. I, thought I he was very command- impressed by that. Yeah, that was really yeah. sort of um, aggressive but certain. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It had a bit of the yeah. man more noise about it where you're just fully yeah. confident in what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and even, even there was there was one when I think he was maybe late to call for the ball. And so I think Graham Zussi ended up heading. It was like a maybe a corner that Graham Zussi headed out for another corner. Or it was a cross that he headed out for a corner. Yeah. And even then, for a second, I thought Bill Hamid was going to break Graham Zussi in half because he <laughs> probably could, um, which is not a criticism of Graham Zussi. It's that Bill Hamid, in my mind, can bench like 700 pounds. Um, and instead, like I was ready for him to kind of seven Graham Zussi's. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and instead, he sort of like he like did like the big clap and patted him on the back. And again, it was sort of like, oh, OK, like he can recognize when he might have made a mistake there and praise the defender for being decisive. And the, the downside to Bill Hamid, though, is sometimes he's very decisive and very wrong. Well, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like Mamon Neuer, I guess, except I think <laughs> Neuer's margins yeah. are a lot, uh, a lot bigger. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, the, well, I think one final thing I'd like to say is, if nothing else, this group stage with the B team is a reminder not to take the core guys for granted. Don't yep. take Michael Bradley for granted. Don't take Josie Altidore. Every time you saw Dom Dwyer with kind of a heavy touch or Jordan Morris yeah. kind of like playing the ball out too wide. Do you remember that one where he could have played it to Bedoya sort of in the channel, but he yeah. spread it too far to the right and Bedoya had to go collect it? Like yep. these are all things that you don't see Altidore or Dempsey or Michael Bradley do. And it's a reminder, like it's not a criticism of the less experienced players, but it's a reminder of just what high level the, main, the core players are playing at. And that you, ta- yep. you take that for granted when you start thinking about, oh, this guy's going to be all like new and sexy and we should get him in there. The reason he's not replacing the, the main guys is because they're not quite at the same level. I think I could go my entire life without hearing Bruce Arena say sexy. <laughs> <laughs> did he? No, but you just did. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> That's close enough. Yeah, and it made me think about like bringing in new guys. Like, oh, this guy's sexy. Like, I don't... <laughs> No, I don't think I need to hear that. From I Bruce. saw him use a very, very bad swear word after Joe Corona missed a penalty kick. But he um, uh, and, was it. And we was it, it was it Melon Farmer or was it, it just when he said Farmer? It was Melon Farmer, and uh, <laughs> he had, <laughs> but he did a spin around so the cameras couldn't catch the whole word, and that allowed yeah. the cameras. I think I don't know if your feed replayed it, but my uh, fuck sucker match pass feed replayed <laughs> replayed his reaction. Yeah, well, the, so he spot on the second one. The first one, however, was pretty clear when he said, "You've got to be farming." kidding me <laughs> then he did the mid-spin of melon farmer big agriculture fan big agriculture <laughs> exactly, fan. Bruce exactly <laughs> oh i love it when they edit die hard for tnt <laughs> <laughs> yippee kaye kimasabi all right taylor <laughs> that is what they do right um it's no it's melon farmer that's where that comes from oh, yippee really? kaye, melon, melon farmer yeah oh i saw it with it, Ki- i saw kimasabi that's my oh, – maybe we've seen, it then. we've seen different edits. For Die Hard with a Vengeance, it is definitely uh, – it is definitely Melon Farmer, <laughs> which is o- second only to Walter Sobchak and the Big Lebowski's This Is What Happens When You Find a Stranger in the Alps. <laughs> 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 that one doesn't even make sense, does it? No, it's it not does not. Close. But it's kind of tough to edit that into anything else <laughs> other than what he says. A salute to the men and women of um, – <laughs> Of DA, is it DAB? Um, I'm not sure what it's called. The uh, secondary audio stuff. Um, well, you're not saluting them very well then, Daryl. <laughs> okay, um, so Wednesday, July 19th is the quarterfinal. It's either yeah. Honduras or Jamaica or El Salvador. We're not going to do a full review of this Nicaragua game, right? Because I feel like we got it all right now. I'm not sure people want to hear too much more about it. But what we will do is come back um, in advance of the quarterfinal game. We'll... <laughs> Are you, why are you laughing? I, I just like your hesitation of like, do I want to say Monday or Tuesday? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back Monday or Tuesday. <laughs> in advance of the quarterfinal. That was well in said. A, in advance of the quarterfinal to um, do a preview of the USA versus their quarterfinal opponents. We'll have some, we'll have a good look at the quarterfinal opponents. We'll also yeah. talk about the changes that have been made to the roster, how that affects things going forward. And we'll set you up for that QF. There we are. Yeah. All right. Quarter farmer. <laughs> all right tyler rockwell That's outstanding daryl <laughs> any last words before we close this down just that i'm I'm proud of you for that well done <laughs> all right everybody thank you for listening to the quick take hot take we'll be back on monday or tuesday with our preview of the usa and the quarterfinal still here okay daryl here with two quick post show notes first of all it's adr Automated Dialogue Recording, ADR. Um, Second, uh, the link to the Top Draw Soccer Show, a new project we're really excited about. The link to the iTunes subscription is in the show notes. As I said on Twitter, there are two reasons to go listen. The first is that you care about the future of American soccer and you want to hear a podcast that talks specifically about that. The second reason is the incredible riff in the theme song. I recommend it.